Hi. Good morning, Eric. Good morning. Got a pretty good crowd here. Hey, Amaris. Morning. Good morning, Uncle Joe. Hello, I'm on. Oh, no, you're <laughs> you're going to make some sourdough bread, too? Nice. Why not? We Wait, we didn't enough to do. Supplies, did we? <laughs> no, we're not making anything today. I just wanted to go over some stuff. But if everybody wants, we can make something together next weekend. And talk about this and then come with a plan. Cool. I appreciate that um, you're both wearing aprons nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like this apron? So my mom made me this apron. It's got my Star Trek oh, on awesome. it. That's an apron. <laughs> That's an apron. I, th I thought it was like a parachute per parachute outfit. <laughs> we're, we're wearing aprons because we are currently in the middle of making uh, croissants. Croissants Ooh. for the Americans. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've never done it before, so we'll see how it goes. Um, that's that's high level baking. That is. I know. I've been watching a lot of the Great British Bake Off, so it's been a bad influence. Yeah, that that's an inspiring and depressing show at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> depressing that like, oh my god, I'm never going to be able to do that. Yeah. Totally, I know. And like, they have like an hour and forty five minutes, and they make these like crazy cakes and everything. Um, cool. I guess I don't know. Let's let's get started, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming to my TED talk about sourdough. Um, uh, I was hoping that you guys could actually, I'm going to put you guys in the spot first. And I was hoping you could tell me what you wanted to get out of today's uh, episode and um, to say your name and, and what you wanted to learn or whatever. I guess I'm going to start where I can see on my screen, which is Mikey. You want to go first? Um, so I'm Mikey. I work at... Uh, um, Dave's workplace. I work at Harper. Uh, we worked together before at Rue as well. Um, what I want to get out of today is learning about starters because I've got a couple of starters in the fridge and I want to learn how to keep them, revive them, get them ready. The baking, I think I can get down. It's more about how you manage your starter and how you get it ready. That's what I'm really interested in today. Wow, yeah, totally. Good questions. Certainly. We will definitely be talking about that. How about you, Abby? Uh, hi, I'm Abby. Uh, Dave and I used to work together, and I also used to work with Mikey. And hi, Lucy. <laughs> I haven't seen Lucy in forever. Um, and I don't know anything about sourdough, but I've been seeing it everywhere during quarantine. And I just feel like I keep hearing about people donating starters to each other and, and I've seen what Dave and Jenny have baked and it all looks so good and it's not just bread. So I'm just hoping to learn anything because I'm a novice. Nice. Yeah, totally. I think that like during this quarantine, everyone has decided to like become serious about baking. I've seen so much stuff yeah. online and so many people have texted me to ask questions, which is why I thought I would just get everyone together and, and answer some. Um, and I thought it'd be fun because we're all quarantined so we can see each other. Um, all right, Amaris, how about you? Um... Sorry, I wasn't sure if I was on mute. Um, I am Amaris. I know David through Jenny, and I know Jenny through a friend that connects us for networking purposes, and now I feel like we've known each other for a long time, which is awesome, even though it's not been that long. Um, I don't know anything about sourdough, <laughs> and so I have similar questions of like, I don't even know what a starter is, frankly. I just have heard it a lot. Um, and also, funny enough, I was talking to some my sister and some friends who live in DC and my sister was asking the friend, they're both in DC, uh, if she could get a starter or something. And my friend was like, on our neighborhood listserv, someone's trying to donate their starter. <laughs> so nice. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is coming at a good time for me to get caught up on this cultural moment. So. <laughs> Definitely. It's contagious, like the virus. <laughs> All right, mom and dad, see you over there. This is my mom and dad, everybody. That's Dolores and Joe, but they'll introduce themselves. Hi, Al. Hi, Mia. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm David's mom, like he said, and my sourdough is probably about 30 years old. And I think that's where David got his sourdough from, um, his starter from. My sourdough experience is limited to really things like rolls 
I haven't taken it to the same level as David has. So I'm curious to learn this. That's right. My mom is, is OG. She's taught me everything I know. Um, <laughs> when are you going to bring back that sourdough <laughs> juice starter? Oh, yeah. You want it back? <laughs> it's a different person now. That's true. Yeah, it is. Uh, all right, Alice. She's um, I'm Alice, and originally I worked with Jenny, but now I think I'm just like an honorary Norquette. Um, and I adopted sourdough from David and Jenny in October because over the summer I learned how to make sourdough pancakes from someone who's just obsessed with sourdough pancakes. Um, and I needed my own starter to make them, but I realized pancakes. And now the biscuits that David has sent me a recipe for, I am somewhat confident in making, but none of that is actual bread, which is what you're supposed to make sourdough with. And I'm just super daunted by the prospect of making sourdough bread. Yeah. I'm also a little worried that my starter like is flavorful, but doesn't have power. We'll find out. Um... Cool. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with like making pancakes and biscuits and stuff. Those are delicious. So you don't yeah. have to be like, oh, I have to make bread. You can make th- whatever you want. The only thing we made with our sourdough starter was biscuits for the first for like years. six years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's only been like the last like, six months that we really amped it up and tried other stuff. Uh, all right, Eric. You are muted. There you go. Okay. Hey, so I'm Eric. I'm Jenny's brother. Um, I got David's sourdough mix maybe two years ago. Um, I haven't used it in a while. It's in the fridge. I'm not sure if it's any good anymore. Um, so we'll figure that out too, I guess. Otherwise, just how to make how to mix. Oh, nice. Yeah, the sourdough it goes around. That's that's my mom's. You know. Yeah. Um, all right, Uncle Joe. Yeah, I'm all here, so I'm. At the beginning of this, so I'll, I'll be learning as you guys started. Cool. All right, Kelly. Guys, I'm Kelly. I am Jenny and David's cousin, and I do bake bread a lot, but I have never done a sourdough bread, and partially because there's something called a starter that scares me, so I've never even bothered to try. So here I am, going to learn. Nice. It's, we'll de- demystify it. Nothing to be scared of. Uh, and Kelly is a really good one that everybody can attest, so she'll have no trouble with this. And then we've got Lucy down there in the corner. Hey guys. Um, okay, how do I know you? Uh, my husband went to college with Dave, and um, and but I was also briefly playing D and D with Dave and Abby. Um, and Jenny sometimes comes in and it's with me, um, and also quarantined um and i i suddenly have like so much more time on my hands i also just got sort of like furloughed slash laid off um and so i was like what can i make with ingredients in my apartment and um and one of the things that you can easily make is a starter because it's just flour and water and i was like oh i don't know maybe i'll like mess it up so i tried it out um and i have a little little baby starter nice (laughs) kind of kind of growing but it's only a couple of days old so I think what I want to what I want to figure out is how do I get it to mature so that it is powerful like someone else just said um so it's like powerful enough to bake stuff with um and also I want to know more about um do we have to use like those baskets do we need oven those are two things that I don't have it sounds like because I know that Dave has has recipes that he's um shared with with like Alice before uh, for biscuits and stuff that don't need that. So that's what I kind of want to know. Totally, yeah, I'm excited. All, all great questions. Um, we will get to all that stuff. Cool, and so um, so for me, uh, as you've heard, I got my starter from my mom a long time ago because she makes uh, a lot of awesome stuff with it. And then recently I've been trying to learn about other things like um, classic like uh, San Francisco sourdough breads and, and popovers and all sorts of other stuff. Um, I think it's really interesting because uh, you can get just flavors that you don't get out of regular yeast. And um, I think one thing I really like in kind of a corny way, but is that it's almost like you're baking with like a piece of history, right? These things are like thousands of years old. This is how people made bread before commercial yeast. And I just think it's really cool that like 
you know, some pioneer on the Oregon Trail who probably died of dysentery was like digging with the same thing as I am. And like, you know, yeah. And, uh, you know, people like in Alaska that used to like sleep with it in their sleeping bags to keep it alive. It's, you know, it's, it's part of, I don't know, you're part of something bigger when you bake with sourdough. That's my, that's my thought. Um, but yeah, so I want to talk about, I guess let's, let's get off right at the bat. We'll start at the start with the starter. And uh, a starter is basically, it's a living culture of yeast. So when you make bread normally, you've got, you go and get your yeast packet and that is, uh, that is dormant yeast. It's been commercially made. It's very powerful, actually. It's bred to be fast acting and to, you know, rise really well. Um, and it's, it's dormant so it can stay in your fridge or your freezer for a long time. Um, where that kind of differs from the sourdough is that sourdough is alive the whole time. You have to like feed it to maintain it and keep it going. And uh, as such, it behaves differently. Everyone that, that makes one, it kind of gets the yeast out of the air or off your hands or off of the flour you used. And it's going to become your own thing. It's not mass produced. Um, and as such, it's going to have like quirks that you have to like learn to work with and learn how to see the different signs of it and know what it's doing and how to bake with it. So it can be a little bit challenging because you have to learn all that stuff. You can't just pop open a book and it says, do this. And then exactly 20 minutes later, it's going to look like that. You have to like learn how to, how to see all this stuff yourself, but it's rewarding. And because it acts differently and it's so unique to you, you get flavors that you just aren't going to get out of regular yeast. And you can make some things that you can't make with a regular yeast. So that's what I think is super cool about it. And uh, like Lucy said, it's super simple. It's just flour and water. And then uh, it'll pull in the yeast from your hands or from the air. Yeast is like a super abundant organism. It's one of the most ab abundant organisms in the world. And so it's just everywhere. And it's always different in different locations. That's why, that's why you have the famous San Francisco sourdough. It's different flavor than it might be in your own kitchen. But on the plus side, you can make something in your own kitchen that no one else in the world can make, which is pretty cool. So to make a sourdough starter, um, basically you can find a lot of this stuff online and I'll even send out a link to uh, what I think is a really good method of it. But it's in the simplest sense, you just take flour and water, put it together and you make a hospitable environment for good yeast to grow and that's it. And then it kind of just takes over. Um, there's, I think you'll put it together in basically a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, I can look this up or I'll send it out later. Um, and then let it sit uh, covered with like a dishcloth or something. And it'll eventually over a few days, it'll grow. And then you feed it and then it'll grow some more and you feed it and it'll grow some more. That at a high level is how it works. Um, I'm curious to hear, I know Mikey made one recently and Lucy made one recently. So I want to hear what your experiences are with that. Yeah, I did. I did make one uh, recently, but I basically did. Ex I think exactly what you said. So just combined. Uh, I think it was a cup of flour and then no, maybe it was three quarters of a cup of flour and a cup of water. <laughs> Some the, the correct ratio. Put it in. Put it above the fireplace, which has probably got the warmest spot on the house because generally the house is a little cool. I think for the for the thing to really get going. Nothing happened the first day. Second day. I fed it again, similar amount, started to see some bubbles on the third day. By the fifth day, things were really, ro it was rolling. You know, it was really turning over itself. At that point, I wasn't ready to use it, so I put it in the fridge, and I've just got some out again yesterday just to try and re-revive it. And this is the point I'm at now, it's like, okay, how long does it kind of take to wake itself up? But yeah, it seemed to, it was actually easier than I thought. And I was surprised that it just basically started, you know, bubbling away without any real outside help apart from me just feeding it regularly. And keeping it in a warm environment seemed to be the, the key thing, keeping it at a good 70 plus degrees. Totally. Yeah, that's actually a great point is, um, you know, I said you want to make a hospitable environment for it. And I think there's kind of just two things. One is a clean environment, which is why you like, you know, clean your jars and stuff that you put it in and cover it with a dish towel. So like, you know, a bug doesn't get in it, for instance. And uh, second is is temperature. That's what I've discovered, especially this winter, is super important. Um, about 75 degrees is going to be like the great uh, golden area for that. And um, you'll find that, especially as you bake, even one or two degrees off will change the time of your rise by an hour or two hours. So um, 
yeah, definitely make sure you keep it at a good temperature. And we can talk about some temperature control ideas uh, later. And what about you, Lucy? Um, okay, so I started one and um, I was following a recipe and it seemed like it was working at first. And the, the basic recipe was like, mix your flour and water by weight, doesn't matter how much. So like 50 grams and 50 grams or 100 grams and 100 grams doesn't need to be like the same um, volume. And I'm not sure how volume matches to that. Um, but then mix it and then like two days later, add some to it, add the same amounts to it and mix it again. And then another two days later, um, take it out and start refreshing it. So take out some, discard the rest and refresh it with new flour and put it into a new vessel. Um, and it was saying, do that like every couple of days or something like that. Um, I think my apartment is probably right at 70. Um, and I just wasn't seeing a lot of, uh, at the beginning I saw a lot of activity and then I wasn't seeing a lot more activity. Um, and then it got kind of like gross, weird color and smelling. So I threw it out and started over. <laughs> And then, and then at like 30 minutes later, Dave sent me a message that was like, you know, you probably don't need to do, you don't probably need to just throw it out. And I was like, okay, whatever. I just, just <laughs> but so what I have now is actually like kind of looks really good. Um, don't look at my messy floor, but it's like got mm -hmm. all, all kinds of bubbles in there. Yeah, it's good color. Um, bubbles, yeah. And um, so this is... I took a bun I read a bunch of recipes online and then I just sort of approximated a bunch of them, um, which Dave also says I shouldn't do, but I think it'll work. And I think what I want to do is more like what he said, figure out what to look for. But um, so this has now been mixed one part water, one part flour, let it sit. It got a couple bubbles in the first day and then mix another one part water, one part flour, add it in and let it sit. And then it looks like that. And now I'm going to start refreshing it. And I think if I refresh it, I think that the, what I was doing before was refreshing too, not very often. Um, and it wasn't warm enough. So I'm going to try to keep it in a, maybe like a little bit of a warm water bath um, or maybe near in the, like near the heater in our house. Um, and then I'm going to refresh it daily. I've also read that occasionally refreshing it twice a day um, can work. And the recipes I've read seem to say if in the very beginning, you refresh for like five days or uh, like refresh every day for five days, or some of them say up to like two weeks, then you'll have really powerful yeast that you can use to make bread. Is that true? Totally. Yeah. I think like you touched on it before is watching for the signs of it. And you just kind of have to like learn that as you have it over the course of a few weeks or months. And um uh, you'll see that at some point it will pick up speed and if it's at room temperature and um, you can, it'll probably want to be fed like twice a day and then you'll know that that's going to be really active for baking. So what is it, what does it look like when it wants to be fed? Um, yeah, it'll, so it'll grow and then you should be able to see how long it takes for it to grow. Right. Um, you'll feed it and then it'll boop over the course of like three to five hours or something or six hours. And then it'll start to fall. And so um, at that point, like when it starts to fall, you can, when you, if you're in your kind of in maintenance mode, you can put it, just put it in the fridge and, you know, use it next week, uh, feed it again to start it back up. Or if it falls and you want to use it later that day, or you want to use it tomorrow, feed it again, and that'll keep it going on the up and up. Because when you want, when you bake with it, you want it on the up. You don't want it to be collapsing down. You had raised hands from Alice and Amaris. All right. Alice, what do you got? Oh, no. never mind. All right. How about Amaris? Are you using um, refresh and feed interchangeably or are those different things? Same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, and it's just adding the same amount of yeah. equal parts water and flour that you started with or just whatever you're adding is the same. Right. So actually that brings me into the next part I want to talk about, which is maintaining it. And um, so basically... The schedule that I use that I think most people are, would use is you want to bake just on the weekends. If you leave this thing out at room temperature, it's going to need to be fed every single day. Um, but most of us don't bake every day. So what will generally happen is take it out of the fridge. Let's say you want to bake on Saturday. You take it out of the fridge on like a Thursday. And at that point, it'll be collapsed. It'll be really low. There won't be any bubbles in it. Actually, I got mine right here. Um, so it just looks like that. It's just flat. And see, it's only taking up a small part of my jar. 
And at that point, if I want to use it on Saturday, I'll take it out Thursday, let it get to room temperature, and then Friday I'll feed it. And so what you do for that is you're going to, um, however much volume of starter you have, you want to put in the same amount of flour and the same amount of water. And so a lot of people, what they do is, hey, there's ash down there, hey, buddy. <laughs> Um, Lucy's got her baby on if you're, if you're not in grid mode. Um, so what was I saying? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, a lot of people, you'll hear a lot of people talk about discarding part of their, their starter. And the reason is because every time you feed it, it's going to double in size. So if you want it to double in size, that's cool. Um, but a lot of times if you just keep doubling it, it's going to get huge. It's going to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So at some point you just need to get rid of half of it, basically get rid of half of it, feed it and it'll get back to its original size. Does that, does that make sense? So if, if you had this and you needed to feed it, yeah. how do I decide how, how much? much to yeah, put yeah, in totally. Here? So what I do and I, what I recommend everybody to do is do it based on weight because what you're gonna see is that a sourdough starter is gonna be, it could be this big or it could be that big and it'll be the same amount of stuff in it, right? It'll be, if I put in 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of water, uh, right now it's going to be that big. And then in, in a few hours, it's going to be that big. And so do it based on weight and so you'll want a food scale. And so normally what I do, let me get a food scale right here, um, is you take this, you take a clean jar, put the jar on the scale and then pour in like whatever. This is, this is 50 grams of starter right now. So I would put, if I wanted to have it right, I put 25 in the new jar, 25 flour, 25 water, and then start up. And then you got to decide what to do with this. This would be the, the discard part you don't want. Um, we can talk about that, but that ends up in pancakes usually. That's what happens there. Um, you don't have to discard it. Like I said, if you know that you want more for any reason, your recipe is going to call for a lot. Just feed it on up and don't discard any of it. Do we want to say hello to our new arrivals? Do you want to unmute down there, Lisa and Jared, and say hello? Oh. Hello. Sorry, we thought it was in the night. Lisa was talking. I thought it was eight o'clock tonight, and I was like, "Oh shoot!" <laughs> so All right. Um, yeah. Cool. We're gonna. I think we're just gonna skip the introduction because I want to keep it rolling. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's. So, uh, quick question. Yeah. So, are you always feeding it equal amount to the stuff that you already have in there? Yeah. So if you have totally. twenty-five, you, it's going to be twenty-five plus twenty-five on top of it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All exactly. Right. And. Um, I mean, you could like, don't stress it. Like, you can go more or less. It's going to be fine. It's going to just eat whatever you put in there, but sort of that's what the general sweet spot is. And it's just easy to remember, like same amount that's in there, put that back in. Um, it's, you don't have to do any advanced ratios. Okay. But it would still work with like, a, a sm if you had a large amount and you just added a smaller amount version, but in equal parts, that would yeah. work. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you had 50 grams and you put in 20 flour, 20 water, you know, it just wouldn't rise as much. It wouldn't grow as much. It wouldn't not be as active. But it looks like fine. Dolores's jar. Is that completely full of starter? Oh my God, look at that thing. Wait, no, it's... Lift yeah, it up a little. It's in oh, okay. headspace there. You pick yeah. it up, we can't quite see it. Oh, there you, there go. you go. So they, you'll see that my parents actually keep a really big jar. Um, and it's based a lot on the recipes you're using. So my mom's uh, biscuit recipe uses like a cup, I think, of, of starter. Yeah. So... That's a lot. This is not even a cup, right? So I would use this entire thing up. The recipes I've been using recently um, only need like a, a few teaspoons. So that's all I've been using. But, um, you know, you can change it. You're not stuck to one size as you, as you um, change what you're baking. And I like to keep a small one because just because I'm using less flour. And so I don't have to like throw it away. And especially right now, I've heard it's kind of tough to get flour. Um, well, you, have, you definitely have to take care of it because, um, you know, especially something this size, because if you don't, okay, you open the refrigerator one day and it tries to attack you. Just might, it just might. <laughs> it's got a life of its own. Um, okay. So the- You're in biscuits. What's that? He's in biscuits. In biscuits. I don't see why not. Do you know. put yeast in biscuits? No. No, so then no. Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. You probably wouldn't want it. Um, sweet bread. Yeah, maybe a sweet bread. Uh, we'll talk about different types of bread later. Sweet bread would be a little bit tricky, but um, cool. Oh yeah, so back to the schedule here. So feed it, so take it out Thursday, feed it Friday, use it on Saturday, and then goes back in the fridge and for a week. Um, 
the general idea is to feed it once every week or two, even if you're not using it for anything. So that's where pancakes come in handy. Um, I've left mine in the fridge for like three months while we go away to like Mexico. So, and it, it was live. Um, you'll see it gets pretty dormant. So if it's, if you've put it in the fridge for a long time, it might generate a, a layer of liquid on it. And that is, um, that's fine. That's actually normal. It's, uh, it's actually alcohol which is a byproduct of yeast. So same way that you make beer with yeast, uh, you can make sourdough wine, which I've never tried and is probably really gross, but you can do it. Um, if you see that stuff, you can just pour it off. You can even mix it in. It doesn't really matter too much. If it's a lot, I'd, I'd pour it off. And, uh, and if it's been in the fridge for a while, it'll probably need to be refreshed a couple times. So maybe take it out on Wednesday and feed it Thursday and Friday, you know, and figure out what, um, what, uh, what works for your schedule. Lucy, what do you got? Okay, so the idea is that you make a starter, you yeah. feed it a bunch of times, um, feed it the initial time without taking anything out and then feed it all subsequent times while taking stuff out, refresh it a bunch of times and then you're ready to go. And then you can go to this weekly schedule where you take it out of the fridge on like a Thursday, feed it Friday, bake on Saturday. When you feed it, do you, does it matter when you take out the starter to bake with? Like, do you need to take it out when it has bubbled up and like is the largest volume? Yeah. Or does it, does it matter? Totally, that's a good question. Um, generally, you know, check your recipe, uh, uh, like things like pancakes and stuff are actually gonna say to use the discard or it's gonna say it doesn't matter. So it'll be, it'll be the flat part or whatever. Um, but a lot of ones that, that call for it to be really active, you're going to want it at its peak. And there's a, actually a nice little test you can do. Um, I saw you had a elastic band on yours. Um, you can do that. So I put an elastic band on there sometimes after I feed it and you can see how tall it'll grow. And so once it's like two times its size or more, then you know it's, it's really good. Another thing is called the float test. You just take a glass of room temperature water, take a little spoonful of the starter, and just drop it in. If it floats, then you know that it is, um, then you know that it's ready to go, that's really active. Um, what if it doesn't float? If it sinks, then it's a witch, if you've seen Monty Python. Um, and if it, uh, if it does sink, then it just means that it needs to, um, to ferment for a little bit longer. So keep it somewhere warm. Um, one day in the winter, I was uh, on the couch uh, reading and I was waiting for it. So I just put it under the blanket with me, kept it a little warm for half an hour, and then it perked right up. So, you know, um, that's like a, that kind of goes back to watching it's, uh, the signs for it. And so actually, I'd also say when watching signs, whenever you feed it, like smell it an hour later, smell it a little bit later, smell it. And then you'll see that it changes. At first, it'll just smell like flour or like pizza dough or something. Then it'll smell a little sweet. When it's sweet, that's actually a really good sign that it's like a good, it's going to be in a good place to use it. When it starts to smell a little acidic um, or vinegary, then it's probably uh, on its way down. And so you might want to have to refresh it at that point. So. Those are things to look for. Anybody else got questions about this stuff? Yeah, uh, sorry if I missed this real quick. Um, when is the first time you put it in the fridge? So like uh, on a regular schedule or, or are you talking about when you make it? Like after you start at the very first time you make, you add okay. flour and water and then you put it in a warm area with a cloth. Like yeah. At what point do you put it in the fridge? Uh, usually for uh, most people I've seen, it says about like five to seven days, you would just see when it gets really strong. And then you'd say like, okay, either use it or just say, all right, time to put this thing, time to chill it out. Cause I don't need it right now. So use it next week. Yeah. What about that? I have another question. Yes. Oh, Lucy. Okay. So when you say really strong, that means it's doubling in size one after you feed it within a couple of hours. Or I would say like, three to six hours. It doesn't have to be like right away. It's really dependent on the temperature yeah. of the okay. house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then then maybe when you take it out of the fridge, you want to feed it and then take then remove the starter that you're going to be baking with three to six hours later. So maybe feed it in the morning, remove the starter in the afternoon and bake in the afternoon. Yeah, totally. Or, I'll, I'll or like it. Get, it, get it mixed in the afternoon. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Or what I'll do is I'll feed it like Friday night, let's say, and then by Saturday morning, it's ready to go. Yeah. Now this is like all like right now where it's either cold or a reasonable temperature in the summer, it's going to be different, right? If you summer, if you leave that growing on the counter all night, it might just 
you know, rise and then collapse. It might even rise and bust out of its container. It depends how much is in there. So we'll find out as the summer progresses. But that's that. Any other questions on how to maintain the starter or anything else you want to say before move on out of that? Uh, so in the fridge, are you tight sealing it or are you just putting a... Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Yeah, no, I've got it. Um, my, it's a little bit loose. And because uh, you don't want... If it's really tight, I mean, you can burst the glass. Um, and uh, there's also this other factor, which is not really an issue, but... Um, if it's really tight, it'll generate more uh, more acidity and more liquid uh, because it's just that the type of fermentation it, it goes into uh, is it, it'll go into more of an anaerobic uh, fermentation, so it'll have a stronger, more vinegar flavor. So again, just let it um, be able to breathe a little bit. So on the other hand, like I know my mom, she feeds hers, leads out on the counter while it while it grows, and then when it's collapsed, she puts it, she actually seals it and puts it in the fridge. And so far, she hasn't exploded anything. So you know that works too. So it's all about what works for you. Um, I also do want to say, we talked a lot about, um, about building and making your own starter, but if anybody's in, near me in Boston and you want some, um, I can just give you a piece this week or whatever. Um, we'll do it. Six feet away. Yeah, we'll do a no contact sourdough transfer and, uh, and then you don't have to worry about making your own. So that's the easiest way. If anybody's around here and they want it, I can give them some too. Oh yeah, she's in Attleboro for you, uh, Joe and Kelly and Eric. You want to uh, just to inherit some sourdough? Yeah, it's definitely easier to than making it yourself. All right, um, let's see. So you I want, one last thing. Yeah. With the liquid on top, uh -huh. I've always just like poured it in and then added everything because I was afraid it wouldn't be moist enough to like fully mix and bubble. Yeah. But even okay. if I pour that off, there's enough there there to incorporate everything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, it, it might be like, it might seem a little thick at first or a little pasty or whatever, but it'll be fine. It'll relax. Um, Cause it will start bubbling and doing it. Yeah. yeah totally. um, and then is there ever like too much flour and water you could add if like you have like a little bit of starter, but you want to make a bunch of bread? Yeah. Like, is there too much that the starter can't do at all? I don't think so. It'll just be a matter of time at that point. Okay. So if you had like as much as I have, and then you add like two cups of flour and two cups of water, um, it would uh, it would probably just take a long time for it to be fully inoculated, as they say, or totally ferment, but it shouldn't be a problem. And you just dump flour and water in with the starter and mix it, or you're like mixing it and then adding it to the starter? Yeah, no, I just put it all in together. Yes, yeah, so, okay. Cool. We had a hand yeah, what do you got, Eric? Hey, do you think this is any good? So you got a lot of liquid on there. The liquid you can just pour off. See, that's what, so Eric hasn't touched this in a long time. And so you can see that there's a ton of liquid on there. That can be poured off. What worries me more is it looks like there's like a black layer under there. Yeah. That might be a little weird. Pour it off and see what it's like. So and go in the kitchen and pour it off and then come back and, then and come show back, us what yeah. it looks like. <laughs> um, generally. Wait a minute, you know, you can scrape that black off okay. and clean out the, the uh, jar and stuff. Okay. Well, good to know. Yeah, I've had it. Um, I had one a long time ago that turned pink. That is not a good sign. I call it the Baker's yeah. Hotline. By the way, you can call me or you can call the Baker's Hotlines on the bag of King Arthur's flour. And they In were their like, website, King and Arthur. they were like, throw that away. That is not safe. <laughs> um, but generally, it's pretty resilient, actually. And the reason that it's like yeast is really resilient because what it does is it creates a lot of alcohol and it creates an inhospitable environment for other bacteria. So it kind of takes a lot to kill this thing. Um, but I managed to do it once and maybe Eric has too. <laughs> so if it looks really suspect, if it's like fuzzy, if it's weird colors, I'd say don't risk it. Um, but if it's just like smells like vinegar, it's fine. Um, all right. I wanted to talk about some recipes. We've been talking about starter a lot. Um, I think just to warn you, I think that I only have a free version of zoom. So this might end in four minutes. Oh no, it keeps, Lisa said it's free. Um, oh, it's free right now? It's free right now during COVID. Well, that's nice. All right, you're trapped with me until the end of this. <laughs> um, cool, so I could talk about the things that I've made, but I'm curious what other people have made. Um, if anybody else has made sourdough stuff, I think we've got some people talking about biscuits, specifically my mom's recipe. Anybody else? Mikey, I you make cinnamon it? bread if anybody wants that recipe. It's really good. That's cool. 
yes, we want it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> How is it really? Is it hard? What is it? Um, no, it's really easy. Does it use? I actually have a bread machine, so I'll throw it in there, and then after it's risen, I just um, you know put spread it out and put cinnamon and sugar on it, and roll it up and bake it in the oven. Cool. Oh, so you do that one takes, I think, a with? cup of starter also. Okay, nice. And does that use uh, conventional yeast as well? Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure it does. Cool. So yeah, there's two types of recipes that you'll come across. One is um, something that just uses a starter for flavor, and those recipes are those recipes are great, and they're a lot easier to work with because what they do is they usually use um, conventional commercial yeast for the rising agent. So it'll rise predictably, it'll rise quickly, and uh, you just put the starter start in there to get that flavor. And that's really cool. Um, you'll see other recipes that might use baking soda or baking powder, same idea. You've got a different leavening agent in there doing the, doing the hard work for you, um, instead of sourdough, which can be kind of fickle, but you still get the flavor out of it. So definitely keep an eye out for those. And you'll see those uh, a lot in pancakes. Um, usually what you do is you take pancake uh, batter and then drop in some baking soda and that causes it to foam up. And that is what gives it the rise. Um, biscuits, uh, another common one that uses some other leavening agent. So let's see, um, let's see what Eric's got. How's it looking? I put it in a new oh. jar. But, but listen, is the consistency supposed to be like frosting? <laughs> that just means that it has not been fed in a long time. There's no air left in it at all. So, <laughs> yeah. So you might, <laughs> if you refresh that thing, and it's cold too, right? Because you just took it out of the fridge. So it's going right. to be stiff and it's going to have no air in it. So, yeah, I think that that's fine, actually. If you just refresh that, it'll come back. So just do one part and one part. And pour it in. It. Yep. One part flour, one part water, one part sourdough. There you go. Now, is this is this a substitute for a yeast packet? Yeah, exactly. So that's, so any recipe, any recipe that calls for a packet of yeast, you can use this. So technically, yes, but it's going to be hard. And so that gets me to the next point. So you were, had walked away when I was saying that a lot of recipes use commercial yeast to help the bread rise, just because it makes it rise faster and easier, um, and then it uses the sourdough for flavor. But uh, there's another type of, of recipe, another class of this, which is going to be naturally leavened breads. And so that uses the sourdough to do the, the heavy work. Those are a little more fickle because you have to understand, like you have to know all this stuff. When's my sourdough starter rising? When's it falling? You know, what are the signs to look for? And it's going to be really temperature dependent. Um, and it's going to take a while too. Like, so a, a bread that takes you two hours to rise with a yeast packet might take six hours or eight hours or overnight with it with um sourdough but the plus side of that is that during that long fermentation it's going to develop all sorts of flavors that you don't get out of a regular yeast so that's why you get those really complex flavored sourdough breads and stuff so while you can use it for any recipe i wouldn't recommend just dropping it in in replacement of a packet of yeast i would recommend looking for specifically for sourdough recipes um, and you'll have better, you'll have better luck with that. And so some ones that, uh, you know, um, classic recipes are like a regular sourdough boule, like, you know, a nice big circular bread seen, I probably post, posted a few of those on Instagram. Um, that one actually takes about 24 hours to make. So it rises for over a period of maybe four to six hours and then it goes in the fridge. Um, and then I make the next day. Um, there's another one that is a focaccia. So uh, I was thinking about next week, and if anybody's interested, and I'll email this out to everyone as well as a recipe, is I'm going to make a focaccia next weekend. It's a pretty easy recipe. It actually only takes like one day, um, and it's not a lot of work. Like you do some work in the morning, let it rise, and then do some work in the afternoon and throw it in the oven. So if anybody's interested, we can do a little bake-along uh, next weekend, and I'll send is that out the basically the recipe. baking one? What's that? Is that the basically baking one? Uh, no, the one I was thinking is um, from a website called The Perfect Loaf. Oh, cool. I made a focaccia last weekend that was also very easy and super delicious. So nice. I was just... Cool. Yeah, it's, focaccia is a great bread to get started with because uh, you don't have to do any advanced shaping and stuff. Did I just drop again? Yeah, there we go. Um, cool. Um, 
That's a great question though, David, in terms of like one reason I haven't tried real bread is because I only have like quick bread, little tins. I don't have anything else. Like yeah. when you have that round loaf, I know you're putting it in the proofing basket. What are you baking it on? Yeah, totally. Um, cool. Uh, well, I'll get to that in one second, but because um, okay. I do want, I actually have the next up is equipment. So good segue. Um, but yeah, so focaccia, pretty easy recipe. You can, you can make it without a sourdough, right? You can make it with a regular yeast and it'll come out good. Um, so this is just a different, a different way of doing it. We'll give it a try. Back to you, Alice's question is about equipment. So um, yeah, I want to quickly go over a few things that you might want. Uh, number one is baking scale. And that is because um, we're going to everything like once you get into like serious recipes, they all end up doing it by weight instead of by volume. And you'll find that again, that goes back to this, that this thing, when I fed it was that big and now it's this big. So if you need a cup of it, would is this a cup? Is this a quarter cup? Who knows? Right. So you have to do it by weight so you can get a consistent result. And it's a lot easier. If you put that uh, put the scale on the table, put a mixing bowl on top of it and you just start dumping in 250 grams of flour, or whatever, of, you know, water. Um, right. We got Jackson on the call now, too. This is a celebrity. Yeah, it's a celebrity call. Hi, buddy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cool. What else do you need? Um, uh, from here he is. Yeah. <laughs> one um, I would say that's one of the only things I call is like a required uh, thing to get serious. Other things you might want, I strongly recommend are thermometer. Okay. So everything's so temperature dependent that you probably want to take the temperature of your water or of the dough when you make it. Um, because if you make your dough and it's 68 degrees, uh, it's going to take eight hours to rise. And if you make it in 78 degrees, it's going to take two hours. So that's going to tell you a ton of information by being able to take the temperature of it. And you can, you know, modify the temperature in a few different ways by raising the temperature in your house, um, by using warmer water or something I do sometimes is just turn on the oven for a second. Just, just give it a blast of heat. I've got a gas oven. Um, and then turn it right off and then it'll be about hundred degrees in there. Uh, I can put my dough in there while it's rising and it'll, you know, kind of maintain a warmer environment. So um, temperature is important. So get a thermometer. Uh, other things, you want some flour. Boom. King Arthur is kind of the gold standard for home baking. Uh, and there's a reason for that, which is beyond just brand recognition. Um, it is because it has a high protein content and everybody needs protein to be strong. But um, it's actually important because protein is what holds the dough together while it's rising. If, it's, if you have a low protein content, like a cake flour or even some of the commercial, other commercial brands, uh, it won't rise. Instead, it'll kind of open and the gas will come out and then it'll close back up and collapse. So you don't want that. Um, so you need something that's kind of strong. Even stronger than that, red flour. Same idea as regular flour, except it's got an even higher protein content. However, right now, King Arthur seems to have, uh, there's a run on King Arthur flour because everybody is baking like crazy. Yeah. So maybe Definitely. just look at whatever flour you have and what the protein content is. Yeah, I would or... say, right. Yeah, totally. Like having some flour is better than none. So <laughs> use what you can get, especially right now, because I know that places are selling out of stuff. So um, you, whatever you have is going to be fine. Uh, and you maybe you just need to knead it a little bit more or something, but um, you'll still come up with good stuff for certain. Um, Alice asked about pans. So a Dutch oven is going to be pretty important. It's going to be really important for making like a classic boule uh, shape, like a, just a big circle bread. And the Dutch oven um, is cool because what you do is, so it's a super heavy pan. Jenny's got it right here. It's cast iron. They're actually not very expensive. Um, and you can put it in the oven. That's the key part is that you bake, you put your bread inside of it and you put it in the oven. So you have an oven inside of an oven situation. And what that does is it keeps all of the steam and the moisture in there. And that's going to allow the bread to rise. If the bread dries out too much on the, on the top too quickly, it won't rise. It'll get a, the, the top will stay clamped down on it. So just keeping it inside of um, a Dutch oven is going to be in a good way to keep it moist and let it rise. Um, there are ways around this if you don't have a Dutch oven. There's, you can create a steam uh, oven, um, basically create a steam bath in your oven, 
Uh, I can go over that in some other, some other call, but basically you're just going to put a pan at the bottom of the oven and dump hot water in it while the oven's on and it's going to just fill the whole oven with steam. So it's a very dramatic thing. Uh, it's a little bit, a little intimidating because you throw it in there and pff, steam comes out and you slam the door closed and hope you don't break anything. But that's also an option. Um, if we're going to do a focaccia next week, if you want to join in on that, you'll want a large square or rectangle pan like that and with, a, with high edges. So a cake pan, if you get like a sheet cake pan would be good. Like what you make brownies in, right? Yeah, like a brownie pan, but you wouldn't want a small brownie pan. You want like you know, a nine by 13 or whatever. Yeah, nine by 13 would be a great size, yeah. Does it need to be metal or can it be glass? Uh, like I've, pirates? Yeah, yeah, I've only used metal. I think that, I don't see why you couldn't use glass. Yeah. I'd Abby, think. when you did your focaccia last weekend, did you use metal or glass? I used glass. There you go, what's your answer? I think they had slightly different instructions for what how to prep the pan and for sizing the bugs. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, it's with this, you know, some simple modifications or maybe even no modifications, you can get it to, to work. Um, let's see, what else? There's a million like toys and gadgets you can get that you don't really need, but uh, I got some of them, the good things to put on your Christmas list or whatever. We got like a proofing basket. Don't actually need this thing. You can just use a, like a mixing bowl of some sort, but this makes nice patterns and it's like kind of cool. Um, and that's so that your bread will stay in there while it's rising is the answer. Uh, this is a bowl scraper. So it's just a flexible uh, rubber scraper that you can just use to scoop things out of the bowl. You'll find that sometimes it's going to get all stuck in there or whatever. You're going to be working with a large volume of dough sometimes. You know, if you've got like five cups in there, it's helpful to have something big and flat like this to scoop it all out instead of a little spatula. Bench knife, um, bench scraper. This is a plastic one. I wouldn't recommend plastic actually. I think metal is a lot better. This one because it gets dull if it's plastic. But that is, again, just to help you either flip things or scrape down things or whatever. Um, a bread lame. This is just a razor blade on a stick. <laughs> I recommend using a razor blade if you're going to uh, score your bread for when it's... So when your bread rises, it's just going to rise wherever it wants, and it might kind of crack when it does that. The so lame lets you control where it's going to rise, so you get those nice, so a nice presentation. Not required, but it gives you a nice presentation. And razor blades are super cheap. You don't need a stick. You can actually use a coffee stir or you can just hold it really gently and basically just make a little slice. Um, you can use a sharp knife too, but most people don't have knives that are sharp enough to do that. Um, I think that's, I don't know, do you need any, any other things no. to bake with? I think, um, I think that's it. My plug is that I don't actually do any of the bread baking. I make the cakes and the dessert, so I don't actually know how to do any of this. I just eat David's goodies. Um, I still feel a little bit intimidated with like, especially like the big fat breads that David makes. That's like a long process and like, uh, but the, he has a bunch of recipes of easier stuff that is less intimidating. He made these really delicious popovers out of sourdough, like, oh my God, popovers in a muffin tin. And they're so, so easy, five minutes. Don't feel yeah. like, you know, the, the thing with the basket and the Dutch oven, I'm like, oh my God, I can't be, I can't be bothered. But like the simpler, like, popovers and biscuits and focaccia, you know, to start off if this is your first entry into it. Don't feel like I don't have all that stuff and all that time. You can still do like easy stuff. Um, totally. Easier. Yeah, totally. And you still get a great result that tastes delicious. Um, so, and let's see, it's, uh, I guess our, an hour is almost, almost gone by. Time does fly, doesn't it? When you're talking about bread. Um, but <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody have any other questions before we retire? I know Alice has questions. Come on. <laughs> um, do you ship? So, do I ship? I, after, we'll talk about it after the, after the coronavirus. <laughs> you don't want my Corona breads. So I have been making business, biscuits with Dolores's recipe and David's pro tips. Um, but the only thing I have to cut biscuits in my house is a very narrow glass. Do you have suggestions for other like creative things I should look for? Or I should just stick with glasses until I can get a, it's like a view of a biscuit cutter. Like how do you normally do that, Dolores? Yeah. You go ahead. My mom can answer that. I'll keep it down. I use um, a biscuit cutter, but I've heard that you can use tuna fish cans. <laughs> 
We used um, glasses for years until I finally broke down and we try, we have a rule of no single use items in our kitchen. Yeah, I know. Fell under that, but then we decided to get them and it makes it immensely easier <laughs> instead of like having a glass and you're trying to run the knife and then you lose the circle if you just like punch down on these and they're like probably like under ten dollars like yeah. and you get all these the, the tuna fish can or even just like a can is brilliant and i will yeah. try that next time yeah, i that's, made that's what them a week ago with these little glasses and so i have teeny tiny muff biscuits yeah. that i'm making poached eggs on and like trying to make tiny egg sandwiches but they collapse and um, so the follow up to that, though, is that because I made tiny biscuits, I made a million tiny biscuits and David was like, freeze them. What's the best way to get like, I freeze my bread normally, but then I toast it or whatever. Like, how do I get a biscuit from frozen to tasty? Yeah. Um, good question. I think so. I think in general for breads, uh, if it's going to be more than a few days, so sourdough will stay good longer than other breads because it has a high moisture content. But um, over after a couple of days, two, three days, you know, they're going to get stale. So throw them in the freezer uh, if you want to prolong their life. Um, anything you throw in the toaster is going to come out awesome, uh, whether it's stale or uh, whether it comes out of the freezer. So what I usually do for the biscuits specifically is slice them open, drop them in the toaster. You can drop them in frozen still. And uh, oh, okay. good. yeah. Yeah. With any of the breads, we have this saying in our house oh, it's not going to be as good tomorrow when it's fresh out of the oven. So we eat like 18 biscuits each when they come out the oven because it, like, it's just yeah, immensely true. better the day that they're made. So yeah. I should have done that. You just eat them all. Yeah, that's just the eat answer. that, embrace yeah. it. It's fine. Yeah. One person doesn't eat that much. <laughs> <laughs> or find like neighbors and friends to pawn them off on. Um, Post. Yeah. yeah, that's what I did the first time I made them. I just brought them into work. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you missed it because people were still jumping back on the call, David's going to do a uh, group cook along next weekend um, for everybody to make focaccia together, and he'll you're going to email out there. Yeah, so. totally. So what I'll do is I'll send after this I'll send you some links for how to make a starter if you want. Remember, you can also just get one from me or my mom or probably your friends because everybody's making them nowadays. Um, I'll send out a recipe for the focaccia and we'll make a date uh, later in the week. I'll probably pick Saturday or Sunday, depending on which day is more rainy. So it's nice to bake on a rainy day. And uh, yeah, um, that is it for now. Anybody else have any other questions? Is anybody baking anything this weekend? No. I made something that didn't require yeast yesterday. Yeah, with that. <laughs> I made a lemon turmeric tea cake, which is a Ooh. recipe I found on uh, New York Times, Allison Roman. It's very, it, it turned out pretty good. Um, let me see if I can show you. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I encourage everybody to do some baking. It's a good day. It's a good day to bake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. That. That's good. Cool. All right. Well, Thank you everybody for coming to this. This is awesome. It's good to yeah. chat about this stuff. Um, and uh, I'll see you next weekend or sooner or hopefully not later. But, um, <laughs> thank you everybody. Thanks Dave. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Jenny. Bye. See you later. Hello. Hosting this. That was great. Thanks Dave.